Alrighty, Slater, welcome to Data Talk. We would just love to hear about your career journey, your education background, just any of the basics that you would love to tell our listeners. Absolutely. You know, thanks so much for having me, Destiny. Uh, you know, the high level for me is I'm Slater Victrop. I'm the CTO of Indico Data Solutions, uh, which is a dorm room company. So I also don't have a bachelor's degree. That's a fun fact about me. Uh, and, you know, my, my background, you know, obviously very heavily in the technical side. Indico is a very AI-centered uh, solution. We work on some, you know, pretty, pretty out there stuff. Really focused in the document automation and understanding space. Uh, so the idea is our tool really empowers, uh, you know, non-technical subject matter experts uh, in the industry, you know, more broadly to take these document-based processes they've got that today are very uh, manual, they're highly inconsistent, they're highly error-prone, and actually have a consistent organizational understanding as to how they should happen. So, you know, we're primarily in banking financial services. So when you think about loan applications or mortgage documents or, or commercial lending, right, uh, we like to believe that the way that all of those values are pulled out of those documents and the way that you tell whether or not, you know, a packet is in good order for further processing is this totally objective, right, you know, beautiful 100% kind of process. And, and it's absolutely not. Right. You know, and, and humans are good at a lot of stuff. But, uh, you know, when you're staring at 200 of these packets in a day, right, mistakes are bound to happen. So our technology really works hand in hand with the subject matter experts to uh, make the whole thing work better. Beautiful. And going all the way back to the start of your journey and learning about AI and tech and things like that. What sparked that passion? And you also, I also read that you're super passionate about diversity and inclusion. And how did those tie together for you? And where did it all start? You know, I will say that I had probably a really different journey into this space than, than a lot of other folks and, and like a lot of folks uh, assume. So a couple of uh, key pieces, for instance, um, I did not own my own computer, right? And I didn't program a line of code until I showed up at college. Um, I, I didn't know anything about programming. I didn't want to be a programmer at all whatsoever. Um, I, I, I kind of wanted to be a chemical engineer, actually. Uh, and then I showed up at school realizing that there wasn't actually a chemical engineering program there. Um, so, so, you know, I would say that, that, you know, high school is very tough for me. Um, you know, one of the things that was, was difficult for me specifically, right, and one of the things that has really, I think, informed a lot of kind of how I approach life and certainly the education side and what makes me, you know, sort of passionate about diversity and inclusion is, you know, frankly, the school system wasn't really uh, built for me. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, pretty highly non-neurotypical in, in quite a few ways. So I, I had a lot of trouble uh, sort of throughout high school, right? I mean, I, I was one of those kids that uh, probably would have, you know, dropped out uh, in most situations. Uh, you know, I was, you know, I just barely got through school. I was in a really interesting situation where my school had a policy where if you were failing classes, you weren't allowed to compete on any teams. Uh, and I was actually the first time that that rule ever had been invoked for an academic team. Um, so I, I, I basically just like very early on, right, the kind of education didn't work out very well for me. And while there were a couple of really awesome teachers, you know, there were a lot of other teachers that, you know, made things, you know, tough, tough for me. Uh, so, you know, I, I kind of got this idea in my head throughout school that I could either learn or I could do school and go to class. And that those were, you know, two orthogonal things that I couldn't do both at once. Um, wow. In college, and Olin in, in particular, right, was the first time, and I remember it was really, really stark for me. I, I showed up at Candidates Weekend. You know, Olin is this very small, very new school. Uh, and they were the first place that showed me that I could learn and go to school at the same time because they've got just like a radically different educational model. It's entirely project-based education. Um, one of the other really cool things about Olin is it has a 50-50 gender ratio approximately year to year. Um, it's the only engineering school, I believe, that's even close. Um, so I don't know. Th there were a lot of really, really good things about Olin. Uh, in fact, it was so good that when I showed up for the first weekend, I withdrew my application to every other college, uh, which was, wow. uh, you know. That's a gamble. And it didn't work. I actually got rejected from Olin. 
Oh my so goodness. I had to like go back and beg and plead my case. I, you know, I won third prize in, you know, this big national competition. I also got a bunch of D's my senior year, right? So I basically just had to talk to admissions and I'm like, look, you know, and I threw myself at their mercy and then they let me on the wait list, right? So they still still wouldn't let me in. But Olin mm. has an interesting policy where if you're on the wait list, you're allowed to take a gap year and then you're guaranteed admission the next year. And I knew that's where I had to be. So that's what I did. So you said that you didn't finish there, but you ended up just learning, um, like learning how to code and learning everything on your own because you just couldn't go that traditional route yeah. of college. And, and, you know, Olin really embraced that because all of the classes were project based. So I had the freedom to basically go and basically any work I was doing for any class, whether that was a sustainability class right, or, or a design class, I was able to work what I was passionate about into that educational experience. And for me, oh, you know, beautiful. it was, it was this data visualization, it was coding and, you know, they were like just very, very supportive of me trying to bring that to bear where, you know, you can imagine like, there's no way you could do that in a traditional university. Oh no, no. Yeah. That's, that's amazing that you found exactly what you needed to get to where you are today and with that being said what was it that sparked you to launch Endico Data? Yeah and uh, you know I, I'd love to say that this was you know some brilliantly thought out plan from you know a million years ago honestly you know sort of to my like I didn't come from this world when I showed up in college I actually thought that entrepreneurship was a euphemism for unemployment and that's all it was to me I didn't even huh. have that notion that there were successful entrepreneurs out there um, and, and certainly, like, none of my family were technical. So when I was showing up at school, like, do you know what a mill is? A, a mill? what? Exactly. Right? <laughs> It's I don't some, know it's that this, is like machine shop <laughs> thing. So basically like I showed up at school and like all of my classmates, they, they knew what a mill was. They knew what a drill press was. You know, they had like built things in machine shops and I, you know, I sort of knew what a drill was. I had maybe used one or two in the past. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, the thing that initially really set me off at Indico, like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't a super grand plan. I'd love to say it were, I, I fell into it completely backwards. So I was at my first internship and there was, and it was a K through 12, like college red, readiness company that was awesome. It, it was, Aww. it was a sub company called Alley Oop inside of Pearson. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Pearson. And so they had a problem where they were basically trying to ingest all this video content and classified in this learning taxonomy to give to K through 12 students to help, you know, them sort of guide their way towards college readiness. Uh, which is great. So I sort of looked at that and I said, wow, you know, crazy that that's a manual process because people were literally sitting there watching thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of video. And I'm like, there feels like there should be a better way. I did not realize at the time that that was a machine learning problem. Uh, oh my and gosh. so, you know, I, I kind of muddled my way through it and, you know, a little bit inspiration, a little bit ignorance and a little bit just perspiration. I got very, very lucky and got some really successful initial results. Um, and, you know, then, of course, I showed up at my sophomore year of college thinking I knew everything, right? It was just this, like, initial <laughs> love of AI, like a little tiny bit of success. And then I remember I said to one of my professors, uh, the war is over, deep learning lost in, in 2012, right? Now, obviously, I'm, I'm very wrong. I was very wrong about that. I, I sometimes characterize that quote as the most wrong I've ever been. Uh, oh. so, so, you know, it was me and who would eventually go on to be my co-founder really just doing these AI competitions together, right? We were, you know, I joke, it was founded from the hours of 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. on Sunday nights. And that's totally accurate, <laughs> right? Is we would just get together and we'd read papers and we'd code together. And I, you know, I was probably a little bit better at aligning it with my course load than he was, right? But, you know, for, for both okay. of us, it was just, it was what we wanted to do, um, if we had the whole choice and we were just lucky enough that it happened to go through some really incredible changes. And suddenly sort of the world was telling us, you know, this thing that you're really interested in suddenly is kind of a really valuable thing to be good at. Wow. Like you literally fell into a hundred percent. Like that's, that's amazing. And I, I was listening to one of your recent podcast appearances and you talked about how Indico practices multimodal AI. Um, can you kind of just talk to us about what that means and just talk to our listeners? Yeah. About that? So one of the things that's really interesting about Indico, you know, and I mentioned briefly earlier that uh, we focus on documents. Now, the thing that's really interesting about documents from an ML perspective is that traditionally in the machine learning space, right, you've got natural language processing that handles text. 
and you've got computer vision that handles images, uh, you know, and never the twain shall meet, right? Completely parallel streams, right? There's no real way to combine them unless you do some like really wacky stuff uh, before or after the fact. Um, the idea of multimodal AI fundamentally is just what if we combined these different sources of information and actually reasoned across them? Um, and you no, know, I'm I'm not really huge on biological inspiration, right? I'm, I'm pretty outspoken on this fact. Like, I don't think that. I think neural net is a misnomer just because the models are very, very different from the brain. But in this case, I am going to use the human body just because I think it's a very strong analogy. So imagine, uh, or here, imagine, imagine drinking this cup of water, right? Or drinking a cup of coffee. It's very easy, right? Um, almost without thinking about it, I can do that seamlessly. But several different systems in my body actually have to come together to do that appropriately. Especially if you, you know, imagine the cup of coffee, right? I have to know where my arm is, right? I have to see the coffee, right? Yeah. I have to feel the weight in my hand. I have to have a sense of temperature, right? <laughs> All of these things yeah. have to come together for me to do it. Um, now, imagine the flip side, if you will, right? Imagine trying to take a sip of a cup of coffee safely um, with as a purely visual system, right? So imagine your arm is numb, right? You've got no sense of taste. You've got no sense of smell. You've got no sense of temperature. And you can see very quickly how a very simple problem becomes almost impossibly difficult because you've limited your modalities, right? Um, and our view fundamentally is, you know, this is one, this, this is kind of the next big frontier for machine learning, right? Is resolving this problem. Is when we look at a lot of the really key issues today um, and where we see, you know, AI that does weird stuff from, from a human perspective. A lot of it centers around this issue that we're profoundly limiting the modalities of AI. And documents happen to be a good place to tackle that, right? Because we really do have to fuse sort of the visual and the, and the textual sort of semantic uh, layers. So it's a really kind of fruitful research area for us. That's fantastic. And I love the visuals and like the way that you explain that it would make all types of people understand that very that's, easily. That's so what I, I appreciate <laughs> that. That's, that's amazing. Can you tell us about some of the intuitive machine learning techniques that you use at Indico that's helping a lot of organizations, leaders? Absolutely. So, uh, when we go right back to the early days of Indico, right, as I had mentioned, you know, we sort of fell into this backwards and it was sort of this idea of, you know, we want this incredible technology to be accessible. We want to bring it to people. Now, deep learning, while it's very, very powerful, and I don't think anyone is going to contest me on that point uh, anymore, right, though that's pretty recent, um, it tends to be really cumbersome and difficult to get working, right? And one of the primary barriers generally is data. You know, this idea that um, if I want, let's say, invoice processing, if I want to use deep learning for invoicing, right, and get all of the benefits that that brings, all that great accuracy, right, and that great sort of semantic interpretation, I need millions of invoices, you know, annotated in this kind of perfectly pristine way. And, I, you know, very few organizations out there handle a million invoices, right? That's a, that's a really, really big number. And then the idea that, like, that's your ticket to play, no, right? Like, get out of my office. Um, so one of the really, really uh, key techniques that we've been adopting and refining and getting really, really good at over the years is transfer learning. Um, and now transfer learning has, you know, I think transfer learning is starting to become a well-known term in the ML space, right? But it's still sort of a, a kind of out there piece, especially when you talk about it in the text space. Uh, but when you look at, you know, like BERT and, and GPT, right? And all of those kind of modern papers, right? They're all built on this, this natural language processing transfer learning. But really, really broadly, right? The idea of transfer learning is it, it's the art and science of reusing portions of old models to solve new problems uh, with less data, right? Now, obviously there's, there's a lot of, uh, interpretation there, a lot of ways that you can kind of get at it. Um, but if you look at sort of Burton GPT, really the, the TLDR is that you can take these massive uh, corpora of just sort of language, right? The, you know, the analogy we use very much is that you're, it's sort of this data amplifier, right? It's something that just is coming with a certain amount of base information to the problem so that you can train it to do a specific task much more easily. Uh, you know, what I say here is, you know, it, it's not a doctor, it's not a lawyer, it just speaks English, uh, but it turns out actually that speaking English is really, really hard, right? And speaking English is, you know, the first 99% of the problem, right? You know, the way one of our sales reps uh, puts it, you know, we, if you want to run a marathon, you want to get this like awesome deep learning model, we're running the first, you know, 25 and a half miles 
you get to show up, right, and just just run sort of the last uh, half mile. Wow. Um, but by bringing that base understanding to problems and by allowing people to then make custom models with, you know, between 100 and 1,000 times less data than would often be required, you can actually sort of reimagine the entire process of building ML, right? It's no longer something that has to be fundamentally plugged into the data warehouse that costs tens of millions of dollars to get started up, right? Suddenly, this is the kind of thing that you can, you know, like 200, 200 examples, that's what we always say, like 200 documents, you can have a production quality uh, machine learning model based on that you know you can do that in a couple of days or, or even you know an afternoon depending on the documents but um but usually a couple of days and that that really changes the game wow that's very very innovative the way that i think of it is it just it makes it easier to proceed like it's just it's just like a shortcut that, that's almost. what we're trying you know that's really really what we you know one of our core values is contribute Right. So we actually even open source a lot of really, you know, key things that we build because our belief is, again, you know, this technology is great. We believe very much in our implementation of it. But more than anything, our goal is to make this accessible to people. Right. Uh, you know, and, and it turns out that, you know, doing that without a whole product bundled around it and hosting and whatnot it is kind of tough. Right. So we kind of offer these piecemeals. But, you know, I, I think that. We've gotten so much from this space. One of the awesome things about the ML space is it's incredibly supportive of, of new members. On average, or, or certainly it was several years ago, that's unfortunately like the tides have definitely started to change in the last couple of years, especially at some research labs that I really appreciate. But, but it is still a lot better than most other academic institutions. And so our view is just that for everything that we want, we got, we want to give back. Uh, and so that's a really important thing to us here at Indica. It's wonderful. And if we, I just want to jump into, you know, GPT-3. So GPT-3 has been a really hot topic in the data science community. And there was a recent article I read by Wired, and it said that that algorithm could be used to mislead and to misinform possibly. And I just want to know and what you would say to data scientists and researchers of how they could make changes to avoid, you know, this misinformation that could possibly get out using GPT-3 language. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know if you have this context. So that, uh, that co-founder of mine that I mentioned that we were doing data science competitions, uh, you know, in the dorm room. So that, that was Alec Radford actually. Right. And so he is like the, the, I don't know, like wow. godfather of GPT, if you will. Um, oh my goodness. so I've got some very relevant background here. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I will say a lot of my views, I, I like openly plagiarize from him on this, but, you know, fundamentally <laughs> the, the risk is real, right? And, and I think that it's something that a lot of people haven't quite come to grips with. And so this is something that they actually experimented with. And, and so there's GPT, you know, one and two and three. I think one of the reasons, honestly, that GPT three is the famous one is because it's got that nice rhyme to it where like one and two don't. But, but anyway, you know, they did these experiments where they basically asked this question of how can we safely distribute these models for academic research without allowing sort of a commercial exploitation or, or even state agent exploitation is something that they're, they're much more worried about now. Um, and they actually had a lot of success. Right. So there's a lot of really interesting techniques out there, like model fingerprinting and stuff where you can distribute a model. You can, you know, edit the weights just slightly such that you can see any predictions downstream and recognize, oh, that came from this model, which is kind of cool. So they pioneered a lot of those techniques. But and this is a really this was a crazy move. Right. Is that they locked GPT-3 behind an API. Right. And this is this is the big thing, right? And, and it, it begs a lot of questions in terms of what they really believe. Because for all of those experiments, what it kind of says is that they don't believe that these algorithms can be safely distributed, right? You know, if they're not willing to do that, they say there's only going to be one copy and it's only accessible via API. And actually, even more than that, uh, if you want access, right, you have to tell them exactly what you're using it for and they monitor your use right. of it. Um, and, and I think it's actually, it's one of the things that's really, really tough because the, the potential for abuse is high, right? I think certainly if we've learned anything in the last couple of years, it's that the, the impact that disinformation can have is really, really immense, right? And I think it's important to also realize that the, the techniques are not quite at the level where you can just say, spin up information and, you know, spit out a hundred blogs. People still do have to review these, but it's getting a lot faster. It's getting a lot easier. Um, now the thing that's, and, and this is what, you know, is the question of like, if it's comforting or, or not comforting, right? Is that these models are extremely difficult to build. 
right? So to build one from scratch, it is the kind of thing where you're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in compute. You're just I, not not like in in hardware to like build out a data center and then you know the actual compute it takes to train this model one time is like it's like a million bucks in power or, or you know maybe even several uh and then when you're looking at the crazy things coming out of china now right and like they've got this big uh multimodal ai as well right that's sort of you know a successor to this I i'm sure that the numbers are even north of that uh and if you've ever read the state of the state, state of ai paper by nathan uh ben h over at air street capital he's got a prediction that this year uh we're going to see a model with over 10 trillion parameters which is you know it's such a like just stupidly big number that it's even hard to put into context but the thing that is um i don't know again it's troubling i i unfortunately i don't have many like comforting words here right like it's a problem oh, uh man. the only like humans are very very bad at telling the difference between machine generated and human generated text like we like to believe we're good at it but yeah. we are not we're very very bad at it exactly um, uh machines are better at it right and it unfortunately it starts pointing towards this weird uh, like disinformation kind of arms race i don't know if it'll come to pass but i think it's a real thing that we've got to think about and grapple about where we can only distinguish what's real and what's fake using another one of these models that happens to be you know like a little bit more powerful than whatever generated it um and, and i think that we're still we're still starting to think through what the implications of this stuff are you know i think that even with even with the AI we've got today, right, that's not sort of significantly advanced, we're already running into issues in the application. Um, and, and I think that's really where, I think that's where I'm most worried today, right, is that there is a real lack of policy around what's safe here and what's not. And we're really just kind Certainly. of like hoping that individuals like, you know, individuals like, you know, Tim Nick Gebru and Joy Wall and Weenie, right, or like the policy folks at OpenAI, right, just decide to fix things, right? That is absolutely what we're relying on today. And it, you know, I it's sort of working. I mean, it's better than nothing. But, but you know, it really does feel yeah. to me that, you know, we need to move very quickly on the policy side. Um, and, and it doesn't feel like enough is being done. I agree with you, and I really appreciate your insight there. And I kind of want to jump into kind of what we were talking about in the beginning um, about, you know, diversity and inclusion. How can organizations contribute to making the STEM field in general more inclusive? Because the younger generation of people right now make up the future. Okay, so there's there's a lot of things here, right? So I think... One, first and foremost, just to talk about sort of the implications of AI and, you know, the, the negative impacts that that can have on sort of diversity and inclusion. Like, I think people often want to hold AI up as this, you know, objective arbiter of truth, and that, that is very much not what it is. Um, the analogy that I use, it's, it's a very imperfect mirror. Right. It's sort of a mirror that's got a hundred different pockmarks on it. And so when you, you show it something, it's going to reflect whatever you showed. But actually, even more than that, right, there's these these hundred little like tweaks, right, where it's going to magnify something or reduce something. Right. And, and maybe each one of those is small, but actually in the aggregate, it can be very important. Right. Um, and, and I think that's, again, the, the fundamental mirror nature of it. Right. And the imperfect mirror nature of it. I think those are two really, really key pieces that people miss about AI when they're holding it up. They're even and this is actually where I see a lot of potential for benefit is that um, inequity uh, has been around forever. Right. Like that, that is never ceased to exist. But. Uh, and, and we've seen it, you know, very, very clearly in the AI that we built. But what has changed is that now, actually, for the first time, we can put real numbers to it. Um, there's some really interesting studies out of Stanford and whatnot, where, for instance, they've tracked the change in learned word embeddings over literature and used that to quantify biases towards different groups over the decades, which is crazy, right? And, and, which is mind blowing. Yeah, <laughs> but but I think that what makes me optimistic about that, right, is that what it really is giving us is another tool to dissect historic iniquity, right? And, and that's a huge plus. Now, now I think that in the short term, people are going to react to it the way Amazon did, right? Where Amazon's like, we're going to have an AI-powered resume reviewer. And it's like, oh, the resume reviewer, like, hates women. And they're like, oh, clearly the problem isn't our historic practices. Let's turn it off and go back to the way where we didn't measure this anymore. Right? That, that's really what they do. Because just like the truth is, right. is tough. And I think that short term, we're probably going to see more of that, unfortunately. Right? And, and I think that's, 
I think that's the most critical, like initial place where we have to hold organizations to kind of count. Like is, look, I, I mean, like I'm on the organization side. Like I, I completely understand on the hiring side, like the, the candidate pool out there, it does not reflect the population the way I want it to. Right. It feels like by the time you get to, you know, people in their 20s or, you know, three to five years of experience, I feel like 20 decisions have been made for me by the society around me about who is allowed to be in that pool. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, oh, yeah. like this pool is a quarter the size that I need it to be. Like, why did those people screw it up? But, but at the same time, right, like there has to be more pressure almost at every stage of the process. Right. So there has to be a lot more measurement and understanding on the corporate side. Right. And holding ourselves to account and understanding that, OK, you know, if the market's at 20 percent, uh, you know, like gender balance, in the technical field. Right. Like we've got to measure that. We've got to recognize it. We've got to call it out. And we've got to recognize that, OK, we're not going to get to 50 50 overnight, unfortunately. Right. And we have right. to look at every part of the log that process and figure out like, where are we losing people? OK, like how can we improve things in, in K through eight? Right. Like how can we. So, you know, one one uh, volunteer opportunity, for instance, that I did that I really enjoyed. A big issue is just the access to computer science education. Right. And high quality STEM education. It, it's just not out there, especially when you look at uh, underserved schools. Uh, and so there's this awesome program called Teals that Microsoft runs. And I did this for a year, but, you know, it, it's really hefty time commitment where the idea is basically software professionals go in before work for, you know, first period. And they work with a high school to basically, you know, the first year they're teaching the class and the to be teacher is sitting in it with them. And then eventually, you know, they move to like TAs and then the teacher can kind of do it themselves. So trying to like make it a, a continuous thing. But I think there needs to be so much more of that. Right. Um, and again, I think it, Absolutely. it just comes back to, it's crazy to me that in 2021, we don't have mandatory computer science education for every, you know, every single student going through high school, you know, like we should have had that a decade ago. I agree. Like there's just so many things that need to change in the school system that just allows for that automatic, you know, inclusivity and leg up in like certain communities that they don't have that right now. And it's just these certain programs are just not even accessible to, you know, marginalized communities, people of color. That is why you're not getting as much interest to reflect the population in these STEM and tech careers right now. So I mean, when you I'm really the, glad that we're able to discuss yeah, it. When you, when you look at the, uh, I would say, amount or like lack of self-determination that you give to an average student today in school, it's so disheartening, right? Like for me, and I went to, you know, like a, a, a crummy public school, right? In, in most people's estimation, right? I had two elective choices my four years of high school. And that's insane. Right? Like no students way. should have more control over their education. They need to have more access to different programs, right? And I think it's, uh, there are a lot of other things that need to happen, but that feels fundamental to me. Absolutely. I mean, I just think that there just needs to be some type of involvement on like a local government level to just allocate certain funds to go towards programs for kids. Because how would a child even know that they're interested in data and technology and coding if they don't even have, you know, a, co a basic coding class to take as an elective. I mean, I'll never forget, right? So I, uh, one of the ways actually me and my founder, Diana, met is that we were doing work uh, through, through Olin and, and sort of a college collective in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, and the goal was we were trying to work with disenfranchised youth, right, to figure out like, okay, how do we get them like interested and like empowered and like plugged into like the job market fundamentally? Um, and I, I remember we were talking to an elementary school because, again, we're like trying to understand all all parts of the chain and every single elementary school student, like you, you ask them, uh, what do they want to be when they grow up? Right. You want to know what every single one of them says? A basketball player. What did they say? Basketball player. I want to be a basketball player. You're joking. Player. I know. Oh. And it's the most heartbreaking <laughs> thing like I saw. Oh, and it, it was it was so it, it was awful because I remember I was talking to this student. The student was seven or eight years old. Right. And. I asked, I asked him, what are you good at in school? And he's like, oh, you know, like I'm a good writer. I said, well, have you ever considered being a writer when you grow up? And he just gives me this look and he says, what's a writer? And the kid did not know that a writer was something that you could be. I, I mean, like, granted, like being a writer is a difficult profession, but the fact that he didn't know and that everyone, you know, the, the only thing they see of success, right, is this like small window into a professional basketball game, right? And it was... Oh my goodness, that kind of breaks my it heart. It broke my heart. 
Absolutely. And, you know, wow. and, and, and that's like, that's in the U.S., right? Like we can, we can do that. Absolutely. We have it. Like we, we have it in us to do better because you just took a small sample size of a population and showed me that there's just so many missed opportunities. And I'm, I'm really genuinely hoping that things change in the future, which I feel like there's a lot more recognition for things that need to change on a larger scale in the education system because we're seeing what's happening right now. Yeah. We're seeing. I mean, you know, it, it's the first step at least, right? It's recognition. But there's, there's still Absolutely. a lot of work to go. I agree, Slater. Thank you so much. And we are wrapping up at our time, but if you could tell our listeners how they can get in contact with you and or if they want to connect Absolutely. with you. Absolutely. You know, follow me on Twitter, reach out on LinkedIn, uh, or ask me a question on Quora. Perfect. Thank you so much, Slater. Thank you for being on Data Talk today. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Data Talk podcast. We share new shows every week, and you can find the full catalog of previous episodes, including YouTube videos, on our Experian News blog. You can get access to the full catalog by going to experian.com slash data talk. And we always love hearing from our community. So if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows or guests you'd like to hear from, please let us know. You can leave a comment on iTunes or you can reach out to us on Twitter at Experian Data Lab. You can also email me directly. My email is michael.delgado at experian.com. Take care and we'll chat next week.